thing that's infrastructure and, and along with Scott's remarks, that when push comes to shove and there's a matter of looking for outside funding or foundation for the, for the capital input that's needed, um, there are groups right now working on state, county, and city public banks. Washington, D.C. is very far ahead. If, if you look on the internet, you can get some of the messages that they use to build allies, and they're projecting maybe a year from now to have a public bank, a city public bank, which will be able to finance um, sustainable, not just sustainable development, but, but uh, worker co-ops, all kinds of things. Similar to the Bank of North Dakota, which is a state model, it's our only state public bank, and that happened because of it was set up in 1919 because of the politics there. Um, there's also Sonoma County, California, which is very far along. That's probably a year and a half from having a public bank, and that's a county model. But it is, it is dedicated in that particular county to funding environmentally sustainable businesses and protecting principal. In other words, protecting the county pension funds and tax receipts. That's what goes in, into, rather than that county giving Bank of America several hundred millions of dollars, which they get 0.49% interest on, they put it in a public bank, they get 5% interest, which they then invest in the local community. So it is a source of revenue, and it's something that, I, I guess I'm just making a pitch, because I asked you to look on Public Banking Institute, which is um, on, the, on the web, and maybe support when you hear about advocacy groups working for public banks. Think about joining them, because they really need your support. They're trying to spread the idea, and the idea that it's not about turning over fiscal control to politicians who are going to play with money. These are independent boards. These are related to cities, counties, and states, but they're, they could really make a difference at a, at a crucial juncture where we need them. That's all. So guys, if we could just kind of go across the room this way, uh, over here. I just, my name is Maggie Cohn. I work for the Co-op Fund of New England. Um, I, I think state, city, public banks is a great idea. I don't think it addresses the need for initial capital to start a business because you're still talking about loans, basically. So uh, especially if they're looking right to protect their investments. So the, the bigger question of how do you get people with, how do you find that initial pool of money to support a, a business like, like the recycling business that, that Penn was talking about is, is a bigger question. And it, it can't be, it can't all be foundations. Um, so there's, it's, it's sort of like putting your head over someplace else where it hasn't been to sort of look at, at that question of initial startup money. And that's, that's a real challenge. For, it's a challenge for any small business in particular, yeah. I think, for, for co-ops that are um, community economic development sort of supporting low-income communities. Really important point, and I, and I know we're going to go across the room for comments and other questions, but it kind of ties back to what John was saying, is the underlying question, right? right? Like, it gets at that. If it's all just, you know, we're relying on grants, it's just obviously not sustainable and therefore not perceived as viable, probably not actually viable. So what is it that we're actually talking about to be able to sustain the movement? You know, that's a, sort of another... Can I throw one more thing into that? Yeah. Which is that I read an article a couple of weeks ago about a, a, a bank in Copenhagen, maybe? Sure. That doesn't charge interest. Okay. Um, and it's, so it's, it lacks the staffing infrastructure that a typical bank lacks because it doesn't... Yep. have the interest to pay staff and pay the overhead. But consequently, it's able to make very low interest loans or grants out to startups in the community. And it really is a public bank in, in every sense of the word. Thank you. Okay. Right, okay. In the back? Yeah. Um, I'm Stacy Cordero. Uh, I do work with cooperative businesses in Boston. And um, I just wanted to, I guess, present a challenge and some feedback about the Evergreen model. Um, the Evergreen model, um, the people who designed and uh, implemented the Evergreen model, um, you know, were, were mostly um, a group of intellectuals and well-connected white men who all didn't live in the neighborhood and mostly lived outside of Ohio. Um, 
And their model still hasn't demonstrated its, uh, its capabilities just yet. They've fallen short of their own goals, which in itself is not unusual. We all fall short of our goals. But I just wanted to put out a challenge that, you know, instead of replicating what they've done, which I think may not even be possible to actually replicate what they've done, is to think about, um, you know, building infrastructure for cooperatives that's led by the communities um, that they're operating in. I think that the Evergreen project would have looked a whole lot different if it had been led by people on the ground. And the guys who who designed and, and got the ball rolling will tell you themselves it was a, a non-democratic, top-down kind of thing, and that they're hoping that replication models will be more democratic, which I think our our friends in Springfield understand understand and are approaching it in that way. Um, and then the focus on anchor institutions also, um, you know, Penn was, um, gave us an indication of the, the faddishness of economic development. Um, and how people kind of like attach onto an idea quickly, and by the time you've got your organization up and running to address the, the new interest, and the funding is gone. You know, green jobs was, you know, was over almost before it got started. And I'm a little afraid that the anchor institutions approach, um, that overly focusing on any one approach um, is going to, you know, I think we have to take a diversity of approaches. And uh, so I think, you know, looking towards the money that's being extracted out of poor communities, um, you know, through all sorts of extractive industries um, that are, you know, mining inner city communities, um, would be another place to look for for a place to to stem the tide of community wealth. And I'd be really interested in hearing um, uh, Tim talk about, you know, how they're dealing with that in Springfield. Thank you for posing that. I think that's good interaction to hear different angles. It's great. Um, do we want to hear from our Springfield folks now, or do you want to just keep going across the room? Keep going. So if you guys... Go ahead, Josh. Uh, I'll just kind of bring up some points that are coming up for me, like based off of the questions on this little sheet here, especially pertaining to like barriers and uh, to, to making a solidarity economy. Hello, can you hear him? No. Yeah. Okay. Um, so like one of the things here, resistance or reform. Working against environmental degradation, social inequality, and poverty by improving policies around the existing system. I, I think a lot of us would agree that, you know, policies that are already existing and the system that's already in place is part of the problem. You know, including things like banks, money, universities, maybe, you know. Um, and then as, as part of that is, you know, the power structure that is also part of that system, you know, like touching on like what Penn was saying about Walmart and whether or not this economy is going to be an alternative, like the, the word resistance to me feels like it's still kind of an alternative thing because things like Walmart and multinational corporations aren't just going to go away and they're not going to decide to go out of business. They're going to continue to destroy the environment and you know, people's lives around the world. So I think that part of our strategy should have some thinking about like how to confront those systems of power and things like banks and multinational corporations. I think that's really great around policy, and I'm sure some folks in the room have other ideas around how can we shift or transform our policies such that we are creating a new world. So do you, I don't know, Josh, I'm gonna put you on the spot, but if, if, you know, what's a specific policy suggestion what does it need to look like that it doesn't currently look like? Any thoughts on that? To move it forward? Yeah. 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 Community yeah. engagement and decision making would be a nice start. Okay. <laughs> or, you know, getting rid of the person who's a corporation. Say that again? <laughs> Destroying the idea that corporations are people. Mm -hmm. That's based on laws and policy. Mm -hmm. One in particular mm -hmm. says that it works. Great, thank you. Um, who is next over here? Yeah. Thank you. Um, sure. I was thinking that maybe it also depends on the society where we live. Sure. Uh, I am from Ecuador originally, and I have been here in this country for eight years. And in Ecuador, we have been uh, doing this uh, solidarity economy for years. I used to work like 10 years ago there. Uh -huh. uh, with this. So it depends on the, like, the government in Ecuador. Uh, so we have two approaches. It's coming top bottom and bottom up. So our policy is coming openly coming from the government. Mm -hmm. Are supported by the government, and there are all other different approaches coming from the bottom up, on, from the community. Mm -hmm. So I, 
I suppose it, dep it depends, like I say, in the society where we live and how you perceive uh, government, uh, mar the market, how you define the market, or all the stakeholders that we have there. Uh, so I, I suppose like it's in city, progressive cities like uh, Boston or uh, Seattle or other progressive cities, they will have, it will be easier to approach city officials or to influence policy, mm -hmm. but it will be in other places where it will be very, very hard to to change or influence policy mm -hmm. at a, at a, in, in a meaningful way. Right. Yeah. That's a great point. I mean, per perception is very powerful. Um, for those who live in or near Worcester, how do you guys perceive approaching city officials? I think that's a useful question. Yeah. <laughs> okay. But it's just a great point, right? I mean, reality, perception, and conversation, and thank you for your insight around where you're originally from. Um, anybody over here, guys? Philip? Yeah, Philip, perhaps, uh, Bohek, and <coughs> some other things. But I would like to go back to the big picture, uh, actually, that Penn started to sketch in the, in the beginning. And that is, do, uh, do we want to build an alternative economy that eventually confronts the existing economy, or the power structure, or do we want to transform the uh, existing um, uh, power structure? I think that these are type of questions that we need to address. And it struck me that Emily, I, I where's Emily? I, I love on the window. Yeah. <laughs> well, okay, I love your schedule, but for me it is too static. So it doesn't incorporate for me a theory of change. So how do how are we going to make this schedule dynamic? And how do we, and then I come back to my first questions, right? How do we, do we build small alternatives that are going to grow? Or do we try to, to confront the existing system and get rid of the multinationals, right, uh, etc.? So I, I think that we need to ad address these big questions as well as the local questions. And then um, two more points. One is to John Odell, where is he? <laughs> I really appreciate what you say, but uh, I would like to challenge you to uh, how the local uh, authorities can actually top-down facilitate a bottom-up process of change. <laughs> and, and I didn't hear enough about that yet. You, you, you tell and, me what the change is. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and finally, I'm also the coordinator of a global research network on sustainable consumption and production, which very much used the same uh, th uh, systemic thinking that Emily produced. And, um, but it's a network of researchers, and I've not heard the word research here. And you can think uh, about research in many different ways. You can think of action research, actually trying to change things, and at the same time studying how change is happening. But you can also think of how to bring in all these academics who actually study these aspects of these things and make them part of our movement. And I would really like to make a pitch to bring these two worlds together. So I would like to talk with Emily after this. <laughs> John, do you want to comment? Um, yeah, just one quick thing. It, um, there is, it, it struck me both on uh, uh, Josh's comment and yours, Phil. Uh, one, one, it, it just seems like a small thing, but I think it actually is really, really big. We talked about the corporations like they're over there and that they're all bad, multinational corporations are bad and how we're going to confront them or not confront them or do our own thing separately and sort of merge the two and I don't know what the, how that all was talking about. But corporations aren't over there. I mean, some of us work at corporations. Um, lots of us do. In fact, uh, millions of people do. And they're good people. Uh, they actually, you know, working at Walmart is not a mark against you and it shouldn't be perceived as that. And I have a, I mean, don't take this personally, but I think if, if I came in and said, I, I, you know, an executive at Walmart, there would be an immediate defensive thing right in this room. People would be kind of like, well, then we don't pretty much like you. I, who invited you? Kind of thing. And I'm not trying to say that to be, you know, confrontational, but, but we're talking, if the language that's being used here is not nearly uh, the, inclusive enough to, to get, to make the decisions that need to be made. I mean, you're talking multinationals are bad. I'm not, a lot of what they do, uh, you could say is bad. There are a lot of uh, very practical ways you could point to. But to say multinationals, period, are bad, and basically separate that from the people that are working at the multinationals, 
think is a terrible injustice to them. Really, fundamental wrong. Um, and unless that gets talked about right now, um, in, maybe not the second, but in, in, the, in the context of this conversation, it, this goes nowhere. This goes nowhere. No one's going to take you seriously. If, if I, I work at Walmart or any large business and you say we got to resist best corporations, well, I work at that corporation. I'm not going to help you out. I mean, that's, it's a, and I'm not trying to be, you know, seriously, I'm not trying to uh, uh, start waves here or anything, but I do think that unless this conversation happens, nothing happens here. Yeah, I'll continue the conversation. I think, because I think that that talks to exactly what this conference is about. Um, whether, whether we want to continue in the economy as it stands with multinational corporations that are reaping the earth, or whether we want to start something that's a little better for everybody. So the person that works in that company is that, that has nothing to do with the people that work there. Yeah. Yeah. It's not that. It has not that. It's not that. <laughs> Sorry. It, they're, they're cogs in the wheel. They are not the wheel, but the, the issue is the wheel, and we need to decide whether or not we're going to ask for permission from that executive to just shift the way they throw their trash out, or are we going to just demand something better? Or do it. We don't have to ask permission from anybody to do anything. And we are the arbiters of our own economy. We create our own economy. Capitalism is the problem. Big corporations are the problem. We don't have to come in and, and make nice and ask politely to our government to do the things that we elected them to do and we appointed them to do. This is the bridge right here, community organizing and economic development. I mean, we can all sit around here and be you know, uh, in, in a bubble, but people are dying every day. Ben said this at the beginning. We do this because we have to. People are dying. And I'm not fetishizing the plight of poor, low-income low people or people of color. I'm saying that the new economy is ours for the taking. And we don't have to ask anybody permission to do it. So, I know Steve over here, I may have overlooked you. Did you have something? No, no, no. Okay. There are some voices over on this end yeah. that have not been heard. <laughs> Thank you. Guys, I'm just gonna just just speak. Just speak. I, I would like to follow up one more time on what <coughs> Mr. Odell said. Um, just John. John. <laughs> <laughs> I think that the the freedom and entitlement to respect that people at this conference want to claim to them for themselves is based on premises in our Declaration of Independence and in our Constitution, and we have a right to claim those liberties and entitlements to respect. But I, I have a feeling that part of what John is getting at, maybe what he is getting at, is that the people, the individuals at Walmart, whether they're at the top or the bottom, are entitled to the same liberties and respect as we are. And we need to, uh, we need to engage them and give them that respect and acknowledge that they have the same liberty that we do because um, we're more likely to get somewhere if we show respect to them just because they're human beings even though we make it really clear that we disagree with them. Is there a consensus on that? Liberty and respect? I, I never questioned anyone in this room taking or doubting yeah. equal freedom and respect for yeah. any individual regardless of what they're doing to feed their families. Yeah. Trust me, guys, I see I see a lot where I sit and okay. people are trying to feed their families. So I, I don't think anyone here, I, I don't want to speak for anybody, doubted right. or questioned if somebody had the right or more freedom than somebody else. That was okay, well, the, the, the expression hours for the taking sounds like we're just talking about connotation. It sounds like withholding from others the respect and liberty that we claim for ourselves. So it's, I'm sure it's not what you meant, but it sounds like okay. violence. I, I, I think that we really make a distinction between individuals. And I'm totally sure that the guy at the top of Walmart or the, or the guy who was speaking this week at uh, Clark University from, uh, uh, from what is Boston Bank, Goldman Sachs, are themselves good, good people. They are not bad people. Talk, they are also locked into the system. How many executives, after they retire, say, oh, this was, I've been there, and I would like to change the whole thing? They cannot say that they are the executive, because they are as much locked in as anybody else. So we really have to make this distinction between good willing individuals and people who are at certain positions that compel them. Well, they, of course, they accepted this position. <laughs> they don't have had to accept that, right? So, so 
there are all kinds of morality issues there, but, so, but we are really talking here about systemic issues. And, and again, uh, it's, we all want to transform this system, but we didn't really start into the discussion what the strategy should be. So building alternatives on the ground is very, very, very important, but it will not just change the big system. So, so how, how do we go about it? That's great. I just on, in the in the um, game called Drawing Circles, and I just felt a little left out, so I wanted to just share something that um, <laughs> has helped me out a lot in, in in my life, and I can't take credit for it. It's something a distinction within our education. Um, but what's said or done in this life, what people say, what people do, if we can stick to sort of like the facts and be objective about what happened, what somebody said or did, versus our own individual interpretations of what was said or done. I found that to be very useful distinction because we begin to relate to this like it's the truth, right? So, you know, I think it's Tim, right? So, so Tim has his expression, and I didn't take it the way I think you took. So, so we have to be careful, I think, in our community work that we don't overinterpret or overanalyze what somebody speaks like it's their truth. It is what it is, you know. And I think that rather than create sort of confrontational environment, which not a lot gets done, which I think is sort of what John was bringing up. So I, I'm just putting that in the space um, that I'd like to, for us to be able to freely express whatever it is we, we want to express and be able to be with each other in our different opinions. Um, I think we were over here. Yes, hi. We have to be careful not to be to parse our language so much that it loses meaning. Sure. Um, like John framed it as like, are these individuals raping the planet? Well, the planet's being raped. I mean, like, the people who are doing it have addresses and, you know, W-2s and shit. Um, you know, but we, while tackling these issues, um, we can't parse down the fact that, con that capitalism is a problem. But to the institutions, the people who have, who run the, the, the big corporations, people who run the government, that's a settled issue that got settled back, you know, in the 1920s. Uh, that we're not going to negotiate on the role of capitalism. Like, if Connie Lukes were here, or if, if our Cindy manager, Michael Bryan, were in this room, their heads would be exploding. Like, the reason that they're not here is because we didn't invite them. It's because they don't understand what the issue is. And part of that is because we're not making, we're not being explicit about the need to reconsider some of these, these, uh, these fundamental things. Um, you know, 200 species will go extinct today. This, you know, the, the oceans are acidifying. You know, the, the issues are phenomenal. Um, but you can't speak emotionally about emotional things without risking alienation of some of the people that you, that you have to reach out to in the end. But I don't think that it should be, the onus should be on, on those of us who want to negotiate um, a new future to negotiate away the immediacy, to, to negotiate away the, the foundation of why we're involved in this. Um, but that said, like, you know, if Jim Polito gets 